Hi there, everyone. Welcome back to the Mental Webinar Series. My name is Jade Forrester, if you didn't catch us last time. And this is the second session, the rescheduled session. Um, hopefully, we will go today without any technical glitches. But uh, as we all know, this technology is not always our friend. So please bear with us if we have any glitches today. But I, I think we'll be fine. We've uh, done lots of tests. We are ready. So just a few housekeeping things. Um, make sure you are also following us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at Mentor Tweets. Uh, you'll know it's us from the big green M people holding hands logo and lots of uh, tweets about this event that have gone out. So you can follow us there for a live Twitter chat. We'll also be sending out various links and pictures and stuff that are going along with uh, the presentation from Simon. We've also got a hashtag for this event. So if you want to tweet out your comments, questions, uh, etc., the hashtag is GBGUK. And uh, we will explain more about that hashtag and what it represents a little bit later in the presentation. So with that, uh, I hope that everyone is seated comfortably. We're not going to keep you here for too long. We're estimating it's about 30, 40 minutes today. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand the camera over to Simon. So just bear with us while I uh, mute and uh, mute my camera as well, just while I hand over the technology. Okay. Thanks, guys. Great, thanks very much, Jade, for uh, handing over. And yeah, thankfully it appears that uh, technology seems to be working okay uh, today. So uh, what I'd like to do is just very quickly review uh, what we talked about uh, last time and what the focus was in terms of some of the work of Mentor, but the, the broader kind of discourse really. So we've looked uh, in some detail at uh, the issue of risk uh, and what we mean by risk. And it's important to say that because the word risk is used uh, quite liberally, I think, but without sometimes a clear definition or a, or a clear uh, context. So I'd like to just uh, share something with you just to go back uh, to what we were looking at, looking at before here. So I'm trusting that people should be able to see that. Okay. I'm not sure if we can yet because the light okay. isn't up, but it should be okay because we just don't have a camera. So I think we, we should be okay. okay. People can always tweet fine. us out if there are any issues. Fine. Okay, folks, can you, can you see this? Uh, I hope you can. Um, so what we talked about before was this important distinction between uh, risk factors and these are the factors that contribute to poor outcomes for young people. Some examples uh, can include uh, poverty, deprivation, illness, or dysfunctional family uh, relationships. But those are risk factors, so we need to bear that in mind. And then there are risk behaviors, and that applies to potentially harmful behaviors, such as unsafe sex, misusing uh, or abusing substances, or taking part in antisocial uh, activities. And then thirdly, we've got young people uh, at risk. Uh, and that really is reference to young people who are potentially vulnerable, who are subject to abuse or neglect, are involved in the criminal youth criminal justice system, or actually are in custody or uh, are in care. So important uh, distinctions, young people at risk, risk behaviors, and risk factors, and we believe uh, and view that it's very important that uh, that that you uh, that that you make those uh, distinctions. So I'm just going to stop sharing that for a moment. Come back, and I want to go back to the camera. That's okay. Great, thank you very much, Jade. Uh, I'm not, uh, not used to using Macs. <laughs> In fact, I'm not very good at using computers all the way around, but there, but there you go. Um, 
So having had a look at risk uh, and revisited that, uh, I want to talk a little bit more today about uh, the, what again is in the common kind of discourse at the moment, discussions around character, grit, uh, resilience and so on and so forth. But from mentors perspective, I want to put that in the context of what uh, we describe as a life course approach and then give you an example of uh, a, a program and intervention uh, something that we're leading uh, and it's a national trial of something called the Good Behaviour Game and I'll share some detail with you uh, about that in a moment. But first of all, I really want to um, uh, talk talk briefly really about about some key messages around, uh, around resilience and I would like to uh, encourage you as well uh, for people that aren't aware. Uh, we now uh, uh, we, you, you'll be aware of our DEPIS service, but we now uh, are also managing Kate, the Centre for the Analysis of Youth Transitions. And I would point you to uh, the ADEPIS website where you can access the Kate repository, but also you can access really useful and, and very well written uh, briefing papers. And I'm referring today to this one, Building Resilience and Character uh, in Young People, because there's some important things uh, in here, and uh, researcher uh, Bonnie Bernard uh, has been a big contributor to a discussion around uh, resilience, and I just want to point a couple of things out. The first of all, changing the life trajectories of children and young people from risk to resilience starts with changing the beliefs of the adults in their families, their schools, and their communities. And I want to talk about schools uh, in slightly more uh, detail in a moment. But importantly, resilience uh, is therefore not created by inner characteristics of individuals. Rather, it's shaped by experiences, opportunities, relationships, and the environment within which uh, these develop. And, you know, it takes a village to bring up uh, a child. So the environment affects children and young people's lives through the presence of risk and protective factors. And whilst the first are more likely to increase individuals' vulnerabilities, the latter are more likely to increase resilience. So stronger protective factors are going to have a positive impact on uh, resilience. We've been working uh, nationally, as I said, and we're in the process of uh, talking to schools about coming onto the trial that we're running of the Good Behaviour Game. And we've shared with teachers a story, and I'd like to share it with you because I think it, it offers a good kind of preface to uh, a bit more a bit more detail. So there's a rabbi walking down the street who uh, bumped into God. And the first question that came into his head uh, to ask God was, what's the difference between heaven and hell? God said, do you know what, come with me and, uh, and, I'll, and I'll show you. Big flash, boom, and they found themselves in a, in a corridor, but like, you know, something out of Game of Thrones, that's what went through my head, with the uh, torchlights coming in, uh, in inside, the, inside the corridor, but there's two doors. God says, come with me, and he opens the first door, and in the room, huge uh, round table, surrounded by people, uh, looking completely miserable and emaciated uh, and deeply, deeply unhappy. But the strange thing was that in this room, smelled absolutely beautiful of, uh, of, of stew. It was enough to make your, your mouth water. And in fact, there was a pot of uh, boiling stew in the, middle, uh, in the middle of the table. And everybody in the room, even though they looked completely underfed, so on and so forth, had a spoon in their hand. And that spoon was long enough to get into the pot of stew in the middle of the, uh, in the, middle of the table. But it was basically too long for them be able to be able to get, the, uh, to get the stew into their mouths. So they couldn't eat. God said to the rabbi, that is hell. Come with me. I'm going to show you uh, heaven. So they walked out, closed the door, went through uh, the next door, and lo and behold, it was exactly the same uh, situation. Beautiful, wonderful smell in the room, but a group of people sitting around the table, really happy, slightly chubby tummies, 
Uh, everybody was really engaging with each other. Really fantastic, positive environment. And the rabbi turned around to God and said, I, I don't understand it. You're showing me the exact, exactly the same situation uh, as in the other room, but these people in this room are really happy and they seem really fulfilled. What's the difference? God said, the difference in this room is that the people have learned to feed each other. And that uh, is an important story and it underpins a lot of our thinking and a lot around the way that, uh, that we work and what we want to do uh, with, with, with schools. So I'd like to share something else with you now that uh, adds some further context. You'll also be uh, aware that, uh, that there's been much discussion uh, as well about the need to intervene uh, early if we want to make a difference. And in this context, if we want to make a difference to the longer term health outcomes of children and young people and to bring up uh, resilient uh, individuals. And the important thing to say here is that uh, when we think about intervening earlier, early, uh, actually, it needs to be earlier than we uh, we kind of logically uh, think. So I'd like to just show you something else. Right. So we talk about the life course uh, approach, and this was shared by the. Uh, Chief Medical Officer's uh, annual report back in, in 2011. But this is an important illustration because what this shows is that if we want to have a positive impact uh, and we want to make sure that the right kind of inputs are, are, going, uh, are, are going in, actually, we need to look at things from a prenatal perspective. We're actually beginning to think about children before they're uh, even born. And that then needs to be maintained in a number of different ways throughout the life course. So from prenatal, infancy, childhood, adolescence, adulthood, and through to uh, old age. You'll see uh, at the bottom, you've got areas of action for communities. So looking at parental support and early years education, moving into education, employment, and professional development. Ongoing services for well-being, health, prevention, and care. And right at the bottom, really important one, secure, safe, and a supportive uh, environment. You can find this, uh, this is part of a, of a broader Prezi, you can find this on the Mentor uh, website, you can also find it on my, I'm not advertising here, but if you want to, my personal Prezi uh, account, if you go to Prezi and put in uh, Simon Clarence, you'll, you'll, you'll come across these. So I'm just gonna go back. Brilliant. Okay, so we're so we're back. So yeah, so we just looked at uh, the life course uh, approach. Uh, Chief Medical Officer uh, was talking about that. I'm going to send Jade crazy here because now I want to show you something else very quickly. But this is recommendations from uh, the United Nations about the impact of schools. Uh, and in what ways we need to be delivering preventative work uh, within within schools. Great. Okay. okay. So here you can see uh, if you look at the uh, the headings across the top. Again, you've got prenatal and infant and infancy, early childhood, middle childhood, early adolescence, adolescence, and adulthood. And if you uh, look at school on the on the left, uh, you can see that the recommendation is that uh, selective. Uh, Early, early childhood uh, education, but then you, have, you also have personal and social skills being delivered uh, as a universal uh, offer, leading to prevention education based on personal and social skills and social influences later on as, as young people grow up into early adolescence and, uh, and later, later adolescence. The important things here are that you can see that personal and social skills 
are emphasized over and above uh, information being uh, provided. And that's really important because what I want to do now is I want to share with you some detail about the good behavior game. So we're going to bring together a number of key factors now. What we know is that we need to address and tackle and understand the issue of risk and what we mean by risk. We also know, uh, because the research is telling us, that the environment is really important. If you think back to when we uh, were together before, back again yeah if we go back uh, to what we were talking about uh, before sorry we know that risk is important we know that the environment has got a very uh, big impact on how and in what ways we develop uh, resilience uh, in children and young people and we know that school is a strong protective factor if you now build into that what the UN was saying about uh, social skills and life skills being a key ingredient of what makes, uh, what makes a positive preventative uh, input, then what I'd like to do is share with you something about uh, our work and the trial on the good behavior game. And I'd like to do that by sharing a short film. Uh, it's only about five or six minutes, but this really sums it up. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, and please do share with us some of your thoughts and questions about it. Thanks, Jake. I like the good behaviour game because it helps our teamwork and friendship. I like the good behaviour game because you can play at home and other places too. I like the good behaviour game because it's really fun and you get to do fun activities. What's being seen as a success story from Oxfordshire schools, a project designed to reduce disruptive behaviour could be introduced in primary schools across the country following a successful pilot in Oxfordshire. It's called the Good Behaviour Game. The American innovation has been on trial at six schools and as Nikki Mitchell reports, teachers say it's producing dramatic results. You're in groups and you sat down at the table and the teacher gives you a piece of work to do. You get these rules and you have to play with them. If you break one, you get a mark. And if you get more than five points, your team will lose and you won't get a stamp in your book or a sticker. The good behaviour game starts now. At the beginning of the school year, children are placed into teams, taught four class rules, and the game is played for 10 minutes three times a week. Each team is rewarded with small prizes when all of its members behave well during the game, but not if the team breaks more than four rules. The game is played for increasing lengths of time and across different activities. In this way, the Good Behaviour Game facilitates learning without competing with teaching time. Team number two gets a mark because Jordan broke rule number one, we will work quietly, while well, then to everybody else who's working quietly. I think the really nice thing about the rules is that they cover every eventuality, really. <laughs> There's nothing that they don't cover. And it's really useful to have a hook to hang any praise any rewards, any spend, any sanctions on, even outside of the behaviour game. It's kind of very sort of clear cut, and I think that's quite good for children. They they know straight away who's broken the rule, and, and sort of they can visualise how how many times they can break the rule until they lose the game. The local authority became involved in the Good Behaviour Game project um, when Oxford Brooks University approached us about an American prevention program that could help children improve their behaviour in classrooms. What we really liked was there was 30, over 30 years of research that it showed worked. And of particular interest were a series of, series of studies that were done in Baltimore primary school classrooms. But then, importantly, the researchers in these uh, studies from Baltimore and the United States followed these young, young children up um, until they were aged 20 or 21 years old. And in these follow-up studies, they found that those children that had been uh, in the 
good behaviour came from classroom classrooms at age six or seven were much less likely to uh, go on to develop drug use, drug dependence, much less likely to go on to develop alcohol abuse or dependence problems, also much less likely to be smokers. They were much less likely to have diagnoses of mental health problems. When we identified it could be any game as an effective prevention program from trials in the United States, that immediately raised the question of well, how good would the good behaviour game be over here in the United Kingdom? We had to address the behaviour in the school fairly promptly. It was an issue throughout the school. Um, I saw it advertised through email and I applied because it was based on positive reinforcement. It was about only four rules in the classroom. It was very, very simple and straightforward. It's very clear. I mean, I what you have to do is very clearly laid out and it is, I mean, the, the rules fit in very much with our own rules within school. Um, and I think that there is a consistency because it's a clear structure. I think when I was initially told about it, the very beginning of the our staff meeting, I was slightly dubious about oh, right. what we were being asked to yes. do, really. It was just quite, it was such a different idea and it was different to the paper management I would usually do. A lot of it was very different and uh, I wasn't entirely sure initially how it would work with migrant children. I think it's hard because sometimes I just want to be loud and um, just, uh, we can't speak to our teachers when we play the good behaviour game. We're going to play the good behaviour game for 10 minutes. I'm going to set the timer now. So the good behaviour game is starting now. I brought it to staff um, and at first they were a little bit sceptical. What really swung it uh, for them initially was the fact that you've got such fantastic CPD. You don't have that in uh, anything I've ever seen. No college has offered that for having year-round training really, one-to-one -one with a coach. Um, I thought you used lots of different forms of praise throughout, um, which is excellent. Is there anything you would have done differently around the rules or anything you would have changed? Having the coach in means that it gives it more importance, it's raises its profile, it, you know, it shows that somebody is supporting you through that process as well. The coaching that I did this year has been the best piece of work that I've done for many years. Um, I thoroughly, I learned a lot throughout it all, which for me, I thought that was, that was very, very positive. I worked alongside um, a year four teacher and to watch her grow was an absolute joy. There have always been suggestions and um, Gail's always been very, very positive about reinforcing the good things. The Good Behaviour Game is starting now. Teachers can be a little hesitant at first they don't necessarily understand the underlying principles that support the Good Behaviour Game as an intervention. Once they begin to implement the game and they understand how to implement the procedures well and are able to find what works for them, they begin to be very enthusiastic and excited about it. An additional payoff is what they see on the part of their children. Once the children start to respond, the teachers become much more enthusiastic themselves about all aspects of the game. Everybody succeeded with the game today. Well done. Give yourselves a clap. Brilliant! So, could I was you a bit want... nervous at first, but then second, I just started liking it because it was all about teamwork. We, our team got a few marks to start with because it was quite hard at first, but now we're a, a bit more used to it. We, we hardly get any marks. I know that the Good Behaviour Game is working in my classroom just by looking at my children. Um, not all actually just playing the good behaviour game, but outside of the good behaviour game. Just like, because it's a lot easier to work when people are quiet and there's not as much noise when we don't play it. So it's a lot easier to work because then you can hear yourself thinking. Just by going in, just by observing, I think the greatest sort of um, impacts have been on children's approach to learning, their attitudes. From September, when they were 
quite unsettled and quite demanding at times um, until up until now, where they're you know happy for you once to all sit in their chairs for extended periods um, without having to get up and down and ask uh, questions of the staff. Um, they're able to manage their, themselves and their time better. It's brought them together as like a team. So I've so the way I've paired my children together, I've put somebody who's on the SCM register with somebody who's gift and talent actually, right. and I've sat them together and often they will help each other, obviously, without breaking the rules. They'll sort of remind each other of the rules and say, oh, no, you can't, you know, and do all of this. So it's brought them sort of together as a, as a class, I think. Whatever happens, it's, it's an absolutely fantastic programme. You're offering children and staff, you know, life skills, really. That's what it's teaching the children. I found it a really positive experience. I really valued it. Um, in terms of the children, they have also valued it as a positive experience, and I can see that it has had huge benefits. My favourite thing is about just taking part of doing it. My favourite bit is winning. I like to see the good behaviour game in every school, in every class, because it's basically um, teaching you to have good behaviour, as it says in the title, good behaviour game. Because then we have quite a nice school where everyone would be sensible, and it, it would be nice that everyone wouldn't be so naughty, it would be a lot nicer. Well, I hope you uh, you had managed to get some time to sit and uh, watch that short film, which really, in many ways, uh, illustrates uh, uh, the impact of the Good Behaviour Game and the positive impact it has on children who participate in it. <clears throat> oh, what I'd like to do though is just refer back to one of the things that um, David Foxcroft, uh, the uh, Oxford Brooks uh, academic who was interviewed there, he made the point that the children who play uh, the Good Behaviour Game or play the game age six, uh, seven uh, and eight, uh, go on as they grow up to have uh, reduced uh, uh, instances of uh, alcohol misuse, drugs misuse, uh, reduced numbers uh, in terms of taking up smoking, uh, a reduction in diagnoses of uh, mental uh, ill health and conversely uh, a significant increase in terms of uh, those children and young as they grow up uh, going on into uh, further further education, higher education uh, and meaningful or gainful uh, employment. And the other way that we might describe uh, those outcomes is that actually uh, they've grown up to be more uh, resilient uh, uh, individuals able to navigate uh, the risks uh, that confront them uh, as they grow up. So for us uh, at Mentor, uh, just to uh, begin to wrap things up. We will be working with 74 schools in this country in the Northwest. Um, and what we'll be doing is we'll be running uh, in partnership with the University of Manchester and the American Institutes of Research. We'll be running a randomized controlled trial of the Good Behaviour Game with those 74 schools, uh, measuring and tracking uh, the impact on children over a two year period. And then hopefully for a further two years, and we're hoping actually to uh, to track them over a more significant amount of time, but you have to uh, secure the funding incrementally to do longitudinal uh, research. But uh, as an organisation, we are leading what we understand to be the biggest trial of the Good Behaviour Game uh, in the world. It comes with a significant amount of uh, evidence and research going way back between 30 uh, and 40 years. But that research uh, is not really focused in this country, so we're very excited to be able to, uh, uh, to test out the good behaviour game uh, in this country. So if you would like to find out more uh, about the trial, if you're interested in finding out uh, any more about uh, our understanding as an organisation and the way we look in terms of resilience and looking at prevention and uh, protection and so on and so forth, please do uh, get in touch with us. Do go to the Mentor uh, website, do time if you can, uh, 
and look at Mentor Depis, which is a fantastic uh, resource for practitioners. Uh, it's been further populated with a whole raft and range of uh, evidence-based programs that have uh, been researched and uh, can demonstrate uh, a positive impact and a positive impact on longer-term outcomes for uh, young people and parents and so on and so forth. Uh, and do, if you would like to, feel free to contact me uh, directly. I'm always very happy to meet and to discuss uh, the uh, important areas in terms of the work that we do. So thank you very much for joining today, if you managed to join us. Uh, otherwise, we hope uh, to see you again soon. Okay, bye-bye. Right, I'll just scooch this laptop over here to close out today's webinar. So thank you to Simon uh, for taking us through the good bit of the game. If anyone's interested in, in any of those links um, from the, the various windows that we shared with you today, uh, we'll be tweeting those out um, throughout the day. I, I was trying to get as, as many of them out as I could during the webinar, um, but we will make sure that those are in our Twitter feed. So if you're not already following us on Twitter, we are at Mentor Tweets. Uh, if you are more interested in a lot of the, sort of the research and academic side, uh, you can also follow at Mentor Adepis. Uh, so that's where a lot of our, our research gets tweeted out as well. Um, again, visit the website gbguk.org if you want more information. Find out if your school is eligible, if it's in the right area for our uh, trial. Um, everything you need to, to know to sign up is on that website. You can also contact uh, any of us through through Twitter. Simon's Twitter handle is at Cy Claridge. I'll make sure that that's uh, out in the mental Twitter feed as well. And you can always contact us uh, by email. Uh, all those details are again on the gbguk.org website. Thank you again, everyone who joined us. Uh, this video will also be on YouTube, so perhaps you're already watching it on YouTube and I'm talking to you from the past, who knows? Um, so that will be there for our future use uh, whenever you guys want to review this video. Thank you again, and we will see you next time.